Okay, we're uh, here with uh, George Ortega and friends, right? And uh, we're going to have some more conversation on the uh, the uh, free will, science, and religion podcast about why free will is kind of just a waste of brain space. Uh, you know, we're we're animals, we're machines made to be logical. We're supposed to add two plus two and come up with four, and there's no point in being free to come up with five or six. Or <laughs> So, so let's do it right and explain why right is better than doing it wrong, okay? Thinking is a thing you do a certain way. There's a right way to think and a wrong way to think, and thinking you're free is just not the right way to think. I agree. <laughs> All right, let's, let's first, like, come up with the definition of free will, because a lot of times people, like, they think, like, free will is like, well, you know, we have more political freedom here in the United States than other countries. I mean, you know, basically, I think we got to explain what the debate is about. Well, I guess the original debate should be about just the word free, because obviously free just means not impeded by something, so in particular. So, yes, are, are we impeded by some rigid doctrine, right? There's no law that tells you to put left foot in front of right foot and then left foot in front of right foot. But obviously the law just ends up being, well, yes, it's to my advantage not to fall on the ground. Um, so, again, it all comes back to some sort of basic logic that's consistent with the rules of the game, right? The rules of the game is it's no fun having your face in the sidewalk, so, yeah, do the right-left thing. Right, and as a comparison, you know, if we had free will, what we did and thought and felt and all would be up to us. Not having free will gives us as much control over what we do than a puppet or a robot has. You know, a puppet or robot has absolutely absolutely no control of what they do. They're doing what they're programmed to do or what the puppeteer makes them do. That's, that's the reality. That's what no free will is about. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but I guess you're, you're basically just arguing it's what's the puppet master, you know, and, and people will, like I said, if you give people the opportunity to make, you know, say the unicorn did it, they're going to start blaming the unicorn, you know. So you do have to come down to the bottom line that we're. No, we're don't blame the cosmic unicorn at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so they always look for that out. But the, the real competition, the real battle is between the human nature, which is, you know, the bug program, you know, and some bigger idea program that would be logic and evidence and knowledge and all that kind of stuff. And so that's really what the debate is about is which one wins and somehow you're. You've made a mistake that means something if you didn't figure out which one is the, the, the more rational impulse. Okay, so Dave, David, um, explain to us what your understanding is of, of why free will is impossible, why we don't have it. Why we don't have free will. Free will. Right. Um, um, I'm not sure at the moment, to be perfectly honest with you. Oh, all right, so trick, trick. Um, well, I'll answer it because it's a logical you impossibility. You can't. You can't have something first. You can't have the free part. That's impossible. There's no such thing. It's a free is a non-word, right? It's the white right. space word. So first, you have to have a cage before you can even talk about free. And then you're just talking about what kind of cages are controlling us. And obviously, a, the cages cause an effect. That's the biggest cage, right? Cause right. an effect. Nobody's found something that happened without a cause. So right there, you say, well, that cage isn't going anywhere. You know, you can pretend it isn't there. You can walk into the bars all you want, but it's a cause and effect universe, and you're in that cage whether you like it or not. Right, okay. So um, one of the arguments I hear is if we have no free will, then how can we blame people for their actions? Mm. Well, we uh, all right, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I mean, no, no, the idea is like in order to uphold civilization, to get things done, we have to kind of like, quote unquote, pragmatically identify people. We don't blame them per se, but we identify this is the person who did this or that or whatever. And if it's a good thing, based on that identification, we reward the person because we're motivated by reward and punishment. And if, if it's a bad thing they do, then we have to punish them again, based on not on the fact that we're, quote unquote, blaming them. But we have to identify the person as the person who did whatever was done. Right. Well, if, yeah, if, we have to identify the act, I think it's the important part. So once you're really just punishing the action, you know, you're yeah. saying that we're establishing rules that are attached to this action. So it's not really personal. But if you commit the action, you're going to be labeled by that as one of your properties, mass murderer or whatever. That's going to be one of your properties. And that's not a good property to have because we're establishing that the rule is people who commit this act will have this associated punishment for the purpose of deterrence 
sense. So you're kind of doomed if you do that. Hey, David um, has. I oh, <laughs> hey. Go ahead, champ. Yeah, what I how I was going to explain it is that like the way that you like what George was saying, how you pragm pragmatically blame, and I don't like I don't like to use the word blame, but here's the way I look at it. I look at it as like a tornado. Like you see a town was destroyed um, and you see the tornado cause that destruction, um, but you don't feel this um, deep anger and hatred and want to seek revenge on the tornado. Even though, yes, that tornado was the cause of the destruction, which you don't like, it, it is just as causal, um, stemming from prior causes, as what a human does. The difference between how we treat humans and the way we treat a tornado has to do with the fact that, well, tornadoes appear and then, and then they disappear after they're done doing their destruction, you know. But humans stay with us, and that's why we have to protect ourselves. That's the purpose of locking them away when they are too dangerous to be allowed. Well, I think, I, think, I think we're conceding the existence of free will, in a sense, with the very idea that we know the other tornadoes are watching. And logically, they will be able to see that, oh, look, that tornado got thrown in jail and he, you know, he got a bad spanking for being a nasty tornado. And I don't want that to happen to me. So we all we're basically by creating the idea of deterrence is really a concession to the fact that people are educatable and you can educate them by showing them an example of what happens to a nasty tornado. So if you're a tornado and you just go by the town and don't ruin it, you don't get in trouble. But if you go through the town and throw all the people upside down and stuff, they'll all get mad and you'll get pitchforked. And, you know, so <laughs> the yeah. fact is that, the, you know, you can't really compare it to an immaterial, I mean, material object just because, you know, people can be educated. And that's all we're really talking about is the tornado of education, the spiral of learning. And people need to learn to be able to act as if they learned, right? You can't expect people to be nuclear physicists if you didn't teach them any physics. And you can't expect people to be ethical if you don't teach them any ethics. Right. Hey, I want to respond to what he just said there. Because I think what we're actually getting at is we're talking about the thing about a mutable, meaning changeable, as opposed to immutable, unchangeable. Like, is our will mutable or immutable? You know, is it changeable or not? And I think that's the key distinction between tornadoes is that they aren't like conscious um, living biological objects which learn, whereas because we have memories and do learn, we are changeable, whereas the other things that are not conscious aren't so changeable. Well, and we're changeable by example. So again, again, it's still always going to come down to that you got the same dilemma. I mean, I never really felt the, about the criminal. I, some people think people are just being petty when it comes to incarceration of prisoners. But I, I always, even when I believed, even when I didn't have an opinion on free will, let's put it that way, I still always saw that broken, them as broken people. I never really called criminals anything other than, you know, you just had to be really broken to think it was okay to do what that guy did. So I didn't see them as, you know, necessarily uh, something to blame. I just saw them as something to prevent. I mean, you right. want to really prevent, bro. You want to prevent the spread of rabies. So yeah, sometimes you got to shoot some rabid dogs, you know. Yeah. Right, Dave, David, how does that sound so far? Does it sound like, you know, we can continue to uphold our criminal justice system and civilization, you know, having overcome the illusion of free will? Uh, perhaps not currently the way it is, but with a little modification, yeah. <clears throat> so, so um, uh, well, so, if you put me in control, don't worry. Because <laughs> <laughs> the idea is like, he's not as, in much as, I, as much as I have sympathy, I'm still always going to buy that pound of prevention is worth, uh, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I'm always going to want to prevent. So I'm always going to have a, a see a real value in, in, in bucking up and taking the hard hit of, yeah, you got to shoot the dog, you know. Let me, let me, as an example of how we can apply this to ourselves, I read a book recently on willpower. And, like, sometimes we're trying to get ourselves to, like, diet or to do these chores we don't want to do at all. And people approach this lack of willpower, of enough willpower in two different ways. Some people will get down on themselves and punish themselves and, and you know, just um, really make themselves suffer 
thinking that that's going to motivate them to summon up enough willpower to get done what needs to get done. Other kinds of people, their natural way of dealing with something like that is to say, all right, well, you know, like I, I wasn't able to do it, um, but I'm going to try harder. They're a lot more understanding and compassionate toward themselves in terms of this problem. Now, what they've determined, what, what they've, um, you know, the studies have found is the people who don't punish themselves as much, who are much kinder to themselves, actually are able to get better at summoning up the willpower. So, so at least w when it comes to ourselves, this, this idea, you know, again, the free will belief is like, well, you, we did something wrong and like, you know, free will demands justice and vengement, vengeance and punishment. What we're saying is like, if we move from that paradigm in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, you know, taking a more compassionate and intelligent approach will actually um, result in a better outcome. Yeah, I, I'm not, I don't want to get into a statistics argument, but those are always a little bit dangerous, right? Because when you succeed, you always say, yeah, I didn't have to work too hard because it was easy, you know, because you succeeded. And when you fail, you're always doubly clinical or cynical about your effort being a failure. So it might be that people are just testifying different to exactly the same amount of guilt they dumped each, on each other. But when you, when you use the guilt and you fail, you're gonna, it's going to be more obvious that that's why you failed where the person who succeeds is going to say, no, I wasn't too hard on myself. I was just a, the right amount of hard on myself. You know what I mean? So it's going to be a different kind of testimony based on your outcome. So obviously the failures are going to have a negative view anyway, and they've, they've even negated their own negative attitude. You know what I mean? They've made it even double negative now. So I'm just saying that's the that syndrome you end up with that and kind of self-testifying about what works. But I, I guess I just want to say I'm sort of an advocate for being a better person through negative reinforcement rather than positive. I, I kind of say the things that have made me a better person are the ones that humiliated me or did something kind of psychologically negative because the stick was a lot louder than the applause for me personally. Okay. Well, trick, trick, um, apart from this, you know, this idea of being able to like navigate um, our imperfections, you know, the imperfections of others better. What other benefits um, can the world derive? You know, what is this, you know, why, what are we trying to do in, in getting the world to, to overcome this illusion of free will? We're trying to, well, we're trying to get them to not blame people in, in, in a certain context. So, so there, there's different ways to blame people. And, um, and like Gary said, you know, the rabid dog situation, uh, we don't actually blame a rabid dog for biting people, but yet we still prevent that rabid dog uh, from doing what it's doing. Uh, but I think the more people that recognize that, that people are more like rabid dogs or, or irrational people are more like rabid dogs, um, the more we can solve the problem of the rabbit dog. In other words, we can look to see what's causing, causing the rabies to begin with. What's causing the causal um, well, progression well, that's I, leading I, I, to the negative state. Yeah, I think that's the key thing is just to recognize that when, once you know it's programming, you know it's program, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out, or great in, great out. So you, you just have to put the grade in. So you have to realize that you can't expect to raise a kid in a sewer, in a slum, and say, well, why isn't he playing the violin? And why isn't he being a nice, polite person on the street? And why, why isn't all, and, you know, it's just silly to think, why aren't they an elegant human being when you didn't do anything to make them elegant? You know, right. it's just basically, basically what we're doing is we're, we're solving the, um, symptoms but not the problem so so right now a lot of times we're focusing totally on the symptom and we're not really fo back back focusing on what the actual problem is and i think well, we're uh, not giving they're not giving them the tools we're, we're hitting them you know you're it's like hitting a horse and you're not showing him which direction he's supposed to go right you know what i mean without giving them an instruction book of what they're supposed to be doing there's no point in telling them they're wrong okay you have to to associate the behavior with the punishment, but you also have to show how you're supposed to be. You know, you can't just say, don't be this without showing them what they're supposed to be. And there's no real emphasis placed on the fact this is what it is to be a human being in a civilization. And this is why we have rules. And, you know, you have to sort of explain that the reason we have these rules is because in the end, it's profitable for everybody. We all get to pay less and have more. And right. The, the whole point is, is that every time somebody commits a crime, it taxes us all. It you know, takes frosting off of all of our cupcakes.
Hey, what right. Gary said is so true, and it just so happens that I was in a discussion on Facebook um, on a comment thread about spanking children, about whether people should spank their children or not. And it was very interesting because people were pointing out, well, you don't just um, spank your kids and whip them with a belt just because they don't obey you. You have to give them a reason why something's the right or wrong thing to do. And a lot of parents, they just spank their kids every time that they, the kid does something that the parent doesn't like, and the kid has no clue why. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's like for, for me, it was always more effective when you saw the fear in your mother or father's eyes. You know, when you saw them actually afraid because you did something, and that's really why they're giving you a little bit of a pat is to say, you scared the shit out of me. Please don't scare the shit out of me again. You know, don't yeah. do that. And so that's a kind of violence you can almost justify because it's a violence perpetrated out of a, a need to protect, not a need to punish. So it's yes. not like looking for a way to control you by punishing you for no good reason. They're punishing you because they need to control you because there's an urgent necessity that you don't walk out into traffic. Yes. Right. And David, another reason um, has to do with like targeting our um, our responses. In other words, like under the free will belief, you know, people in society do wrong. Let's say they live in inner cities, so they commit more crimes. So under the present system, we say to ourselves, well, they have a free will. Not everybody who lives in the city in their city is committing crimes. So the problem has to be with them. Right. But, you know, if they don't have a free will, the problem isn't really with them. The problem is more clearly with the society that that creates the kind of conditions where, you know, at least some people, you know, through no fault of their own, are going to succumb to um, to the temptations to do crime. So in other words, it's shifting the the like we were saying before, it's shifting our focus from the symptom, which is the person committing the crime and thinking that like if we just punish them enough and we just scare everybody enough that's going to you know solve the problem to understanding wait a minute the person's doing what they're doing because society's structured in a certain way because they're in a certain environment and until we change the environment we can't expect you know that much from the individual because then the individual is, is subject to a lot of these kinds of like conditions they're not completely controlled now i'm not saying that like we we can't control some of their behaviors but like at least part of the answer has to be from restructuring society. Yeah, I think it's a performance issue, right? So you can almost compare it to cars. You don't expect uh, whatever Honda to make, uh, you know, a race car or something. You know, what I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they, because they don't put the ingredients in. So you can sort of understand that some stores sell products that are, you know, they're, they're cheap, cheaply made, right? So you don't expect the cheap thing to work as well as the thing that costs five times as much as made out of real wood and all that kind of stuff. And it's just kind of silly that we can say, well, yes, sometimes the cheap thing does the job. But we know that over time, if you, you know, it's not going to be as durable, it's not going to be the, as reliable, and it's not going to be as dependable as producing that quality person. Because it's going to take an exceptional cheap thing. Whether you know, it's not, it's not going to be the average cheap thing that's going to work. It's going to be the exceptional cheap thing. So we're doing it on the cheap and then we're expecting it to work as well as the thing that was made you know in the middle class you know cultured environment that had you know they played an instrument and had quiet time and you know what i'm saying i mean quite obvious anybody can logically see that you know you can just imagine your own self and say how could i become the person i am if i had to uh, dodge bullets all day exactly and david the other part of this um, how does it resonate with you when we say that, like, well, we're not doing this simply for pragmatic reasons. I think we're also doing this for a proper understanding of who, who we are as human beings. In other words, like, you know, the, the almost the entire human race has the, the, the basic understanding of why we do things completely wrong. So how does, how does this truth factor resonate with you? Uh, it makes a lot of sense, to be honest, yeah, but um, there's still roughly half the population that believes in things like capital punishment, so it's how to correct that problem. <clears throat> yeah, well, you got one of them in the room. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't really see it as an issue of what we use as deterrence. I just, like I said, I value deterrence very much, so I'm, I'm all, you know, like I said, I'd rather prevent the crime with uh, uh, making suggestions to the logic of the criminal, because so they all have some logic, right? They're a scheming mind, and you will change their uh, behavior by changing 
what's going to happen to them by committing the behavior. So I'm just saying if you make crime pay, people will do it. Well, there is a, a statistic that shows that um, a lot of people do commit murders out of crimes of passion. So it's not really something that gets thought through. They don't think about the consequences. Well, I'm not saying that that, that, isn't, that doesn't ever happen, but I'm just saying it's sure. still a calculation. And I'm just saying that if you give them something to calculate with, okay, if you give them ingredients in the math, okay, one divided by seven million or something, and maybe they'll figure out, you know, if you make that number, that denominator big enough or the numerator big enough, they'll come up with the answer that says, well, that's a zero win. You know, I ain't going to win that lottery. Yeah. Okay, it's like yeah. having a tax on the lottery, right? If you put a tax on the lottery that's higher than the winnings, people will figure out, I'm not buying that ticket, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that David, makes sense. David, I think another thing, like decades ago, this crimes of passion defense was more respected. In other words, like, you know, people recognized the person, like, was, you know, really distraught, and so they couldn't really help themselves, and that, that was used. In today's climate, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in the United States... I don't think that defense is very effective anymore because this belief in free will is so strong. Right now, like in the United States, people will say, well, you know, the, the crimes of passion defense is, 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 is wrong because like if, if a person A could uh, have like responded to the same um, situation without, you know, getting all, you know, um, distraught and all, then person B could have also. So in other words, like, Basically, they're they're operating from this free will perspective that people should have the because people have a free will, they should be overcome. They should be able to overcome their tendency to get all distraught to the extent that they commit a crime. Well, I, I'm just saying that I think some of that zero tolerance stuff is just a, a fact. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I could make the the penalty high enough for jaywalking where. 99.99% of jaywalkers will stop jaywalking, okay? I mean, if I have a death penalty for jaywalking tomorrow, everybody's going to be a little bit more aware of it, and they're going to say, yeah, it's really not, di it's really not, really not what we're dying for. So, you know, I'm going to stop a lot of it. So I'm just saying we are programmable, and part of the programming is the examples we provide. So I'm just saying I still value deterrence. That's my only argument is that I put a value on preventing it rather than cleaning up crime. So, yeah, I'd rather prevent it through persuasion and logic and explain to people, look, you're a social animal, you exist in this circumstance, if you have to punch something, punch the inanimate object, not the sentient being, you know, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Just explain yeah. how to deal with your anger, deal with your frustration in rational ways. You're allowed to yell at people, you're allowed to get angry, you're just not allowed to start breaking stuff. Okay, and David. Again, how does how does the truth factor resonate? How does it how does it seem to you that like the world is so completely deluded about who we are as human beings? Um, yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people are oblivious to the fact that you know we're all kind of victims of our environment to, to a certain degree. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, I see I see that all the time. Even more than that, David, in other words, like we are we have no more control over what we do than than does a puppet or a marionette or a robot. You know, like that's a categorically fundamentally opposite perspective from what we have now. Right now we're walking around the planet thinking the stuff is up to us and absolutely nothing is up to us. You know, that that's why I think Searle said this, you know, for the world to overcome this belief would be a bigger revolution in human thinking that has ever happened on the planet. Right, right. Yeah. yeah my, only, my only qualification to that is, is you know, it's, I think the part of it that's important to recognize is that we are bugs, you know, that we're machines, you know, as you're basically saying, and that the machine is only going to be as good as what you program it to be. It's only going to play the violin as well as it practices. All these things are required. You have to learn before you can function. And people sort of have this idea that I can know economics and I can know chemistry and I can know physics because I watched an hour long, long TV show. You know, I'm a, now I'm a qualified, <laughs> you know, I've done all the work necessary to have a qualified opinion. So everybody's walking around with this notion that I'm just going to freely get the right answer and the right answer isn't going to be free. Knowledge isn't free. You have to, you have to have, you have to do this work of acquiring uh, knowledge to have uh, competency and proficiency and all of that stuff. It doesn't, it is not free. And people just sort of have this notion that I'm on earth. I have a mouth. I can talk. Well, you know, it's a little more complicated than that. Hey, and what, I if, what if it was two hours? 
Yeah. yeah well, it's getting, it's, getting, it's getting close. Okay, it's close. Hey, I, I here's how I can sum up the problem that humanity faces. Basically, we we walk around most of us with this daily assumption that other people have the access to all the same information, that they know all the same things that we know, that they have the same desires that we have. We make the assumption thinking that everyone is like us when they have they have different genetics, they had different parents, were taught different things, grew up in different places, got used to different cultures. And so when you start understanding that, y you think of this person, you look at someone do something stupid and you think, well, they should have done this. I would have done that in that situation, but here's the deal. If you were in that situation, you would be that person who was in that situation doing that thing, and you have their memories, their level of intelligence, their experiences, you would do what they did, and they would be doing what you would do in every situation in your life. And that's yeah. the quality that I see. Yeah, I, I like the idea of just seeing through people's heads and just seeing the fact that they are gears and just recognizing, oh, I can see they have that broken gear over there. You know, and they're just recognizing like a lawnmower or something. Oh, yeah, it's not going to be able to cut the grass because, yeah, that drive gear is broken. Look at all the teeth that are missing. So, yeah, this guy needs, you know, this guy needs a better gear, you know. Right. Yeah, we got to look at them as, as uh, conscious gears, though. So, so when we say, word, use words like puppet and things like that, I think we kind of take away some of that. People, people start to think that, oh, that, that implies that they're not conscious, but... In reality, it's the whole causal process is a, is a conscious process, and that means uh, how we learn and how we uh, understand yeah, but things. I think I think George would is say part of the process. Oh, no, 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 it's a subconscious process. So that your consciousness is a victim. You know, your consciousness is tied up in the theater seat. Your consciousness doesn't do anything. It just it can't even get up and go get, get a glass of water. It just has to watch what happens you happen to you. The crap comes out of your mouth whether you like it or not. I mean, I don't get to edit myself before I just said that. My right. consciousness is totally, right. you're, totally you're, just sitting here saying, oh, wait, Gary's doing stuff. Oh, no. Because right. it's, Gary, it's part of the causal stupid. process. Well, well so I'm it's, just saying that it's all, but it's not a conscious process. It's well, yeah, it is. I mean, your, your subconscious leads to your conscious process, which leads to the next uh, sub sub saying, subconscious process. No, I, I'm saying I, I totally disagree. There's no conscious process. Your consciousness doesn't do anything but watch. What's yeah, happening? I would agree with Gary. In other words, like the processing of the decision is all done in the unconscious, and then consciousness is just like we becoming aware of what the unconscious has done. Yeah, but the, but the processing of the subconscious happens because of the consciousness that, that happens. So, so if I'm talking to you right now, you're processing my information, and it's and then 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 it's coming through a subconscious process to output your next. So, well, I'm so just it's, it's part of the. Now, every element of the real active ingredients, the active moving parts, are all subconsciously thrown. So I'm just saying the consciousness doesn't itself do a single thing. Every reaction or reflexive thing that happens. Guys, guys, so we're, we're going the, on. Gary, yeah, we're going on. Like, we've got about two minutes left. This is an excellent theme. If you guys want to stick around, like, the, the unconsciousness versus the consciousness and the decision making, I think people need to understand this. We got another two minutes left in this. I just wanted to say the reason I bring up this idea of, of our being no, having no more control than a puppet or a robot is simply to demonstrate what it would be to have a free will and what it is to not have a free will, right? But Trick, what you were saying before is very important. People don't like to see themselves as robots or puppets. But so it's one it's one plus that we can say fine we're not robots and puppets without consciousness we're robots and puppets with a consciousness but I still don't think that's enough for people we have to come up with with somewhat kind of way to get people to accept the fact that they're conscious puppets and like it somehow I like it <laughs> uh, well, I'm, per I'm perfectly comfortable just saying I'm a victim so yeah I think that's just great I'm, yeah they tied me in the chair what did I have to do with any of this right I didn't do any of it so it works for me cool alright we've got like 50 seconds left Gary you want to close it up yeah okay yeah it's a good conversation I really think it is a mind um, conversation really it's just understanding the operating instructions of being a human being human beings have this brain thing it has gears in it you have to understand the gears make you behave so you got to polish them and you got to oil them with knowledge and you got to take care of them and shine them and all that crud and they got to be made out of strong material and so you're just knowing those that's how you build the character characters build out of something it's not built out of nothing you can't raise kids in slums and then say why doesn't it have character <laughs> well, because you, you didn't give it any good gears. I mean, its gears got a bunch of dirt in it. 
Yeah. Excellent. Right. Ten seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think I think we've done our job. So uh, till next time, till the next exciting episode when Superman will do all kinds of special things. <laughs>